Good evening. My name is Julie Bunchek, and I'm a program manager with the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service. On behalf of my colleagues at WIPS, I am delighted to welcome you to our first public in-person event in more than two years, the Veninga Lecture on Religion and Society. Jim Veninga, former UW Marathon County Dean, religious studies professor, and a founding father of WIPS, created this annual lecture series to help engage people on religion and its relationship to society. Although he died in January 2014, his vision lives on through all of WIPS programs, but most especially through his namesake Religion and Society lecture series. We would like to thank the sponsors for this event, UW Stevens Point at Wausau, Wisconsin Public Radio, and Bremer and Trollope Law Offices. This series is also underwritten by generous gifts from Mark and Ann Bradley, Chris and Paul Bremer Moogley, and Linda and Lane Ware. If after our program tonight, you are inspired, moved, pleased, or otherwise enjoyed the event, we encourage you to make a donation to WIPS. We are a self-supporting organization and depend on the generosity of our supporters to survive and thrive. Your support will help secure the continuation of WIPS as an organization, as well as ensure future programs like the Veninga Lecture. Donation envelopes can be found at the WIPS table as you exit the theater, and there's also information there about our annual membership program. And now, please welcome Dr. Ann herder -Rapp, campus executive here at UW Stevens Point at Wausau, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Hi there, and welcome back. I have the very good fortune, for a multitude of reasons, of introducing tonight's speaker. Jenny Veninga, a sixth generation Texan, didn't exactly grow up here in Wausau, but spent a lot of time here, uh, here and at uh, the Tiger Cat Flowage up near Hayward. You might have heard about um, the family cabin. cabin. Wasa and Hayward became second homes to Jenny when her father, Jim, served as our campus dean and at the same time that Jenny went off to college. So she completed her BA first at Southern Methodist, Methodist University. Then she went on to Harvard Divinity School, following in her father's footsteps, for a master's of theological studies, followed by a PhD in Systematic and Philosophical Theology from the Graduate Theological Institute in Berkeley, California. She's currently an Associate Professor of Religious and Theological Studies at St. Edwards University in Austin. Jenny's research interests include Soren Kierkegaard and ex Existentialism, Scandinavian Religion and Politics, Islam and the West, Trauma and Collective Memory, and feminist and queer theologies. She's the author of Secularism, Theology, and Islam, The Danish Social Imaginary, and The Cartoon Crisis of 2005-2006. And she's currently researching the intersections of theology and trauma studies, which she'll be speaking about with us this evening. I'm so pleased to introduce you to Jenny, speaking in the lecture series established by her father, from the theater named after her father, the Reverend Dr. Jenny Veninga. Good evening. It's hard to express the honor and gratitude I have to be with you here tonight to celebrate the 10th anniversary James F. Veninga Lecture on Religion and Society. To be here in this beautiful theater named after my father and the presence of so many who knew and were inspired by him and his leadership is truly a gift. What a joy to gather with old and dear friends and to meet new friends. 
I want to thank the staff at WIPS, including Eric Giordano for the invitation, and Julie Buncheck for all of her work in coordinating this program and making it the beautiful event that it is. I also want to recognize my family here tonight, especially my mother, Catherine Williams, who was and is not only my sole guide and my father's partner in marriage, but also his partner in visioning forth the kinds of values that WIPS holds dear, democratic engagement, inclusive education, and the necessity of arts, culture, and the humanities, as well as cross-disciplinary collaboration. I'm grateful too to my extended family with us tonight, my aunts and uncles, Bob and Karen Veninga from the Twin Cities, and Joyce and Jerry Anderson, who traveled all the way from Oregon. My partner, Jack, and my three-year-old son, Elliot James Veninga, pictured here, are watching from our home in Austin, Texas. I send greetings to others who are attending through the miracle of technology. We each come here tonight shaped by particular lineages and legacies, and by all of those past and present who have mentored, taught, and inspired us through formal and informal education. There are those, including my father, who have also encouraged us to become better citizens and stewards of the democratic ideals of our nation. We are also supported by the peoples who have come before us and alongside us, whose land on which we live. In this vein, particularly given the subject of my talk tonight, I want to recognize that the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point at Wausau occupies lands of the Ojibwe, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk people. We acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ojibwe, Menominee, and Ho-Chunk land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. I'd like to invite us now to take just a moment of silence to remember and give gratitude to all of these individuals and communities. Thank you. And I want to express a particular gratitude pr to Professor Brett Barker for assisting me with this land acknowledgement. That this lecture is happening tonight in person is to be celebrated, as has already been said tonight. As you may know, this 10th Veninga lecture was scheduled to take place in September of 2020, and Julie and I began corresponding about topics and plans way back in 2019 which I don't know about you, but feels like a lifetime ago, the before times. Permit me to do a bit of reflecting back on these last years. Of course, March of 2020 came and interrupted our plans for this lecture. A global trauma ensued with much of the world literally coming to a stop, while at the same time, frontline workers labored harder than ever before to sustain life in the midst of deadly conditions. We just reached the grim milestone of one million deaths in our country, and no doubt many of you tonight have experienced deep loss, not only of lives, but also employment, time with loved ones, and pre-pandemic ways of being. Late May of 2020 brought another trauma to the US when George Floyd was murdered by white police officer Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis, opening the wounds yet again of systemic racism here in our nation. Next Wednesday, in fact, will mark the one year anniversary of Floyd's murder. We also saw a rise in anti-Semitism from white nationalists and an unprecedented insurrection and assault on our capital in early 2021, as well as upsurges in anti-Asian violence. And then more waves of the pandemic continued Delta, Omicron, and even now, as many are vaccinated, we are still concerned about subvariants. I especially worry about this as Elliot is still too young to receive a vaccine. In the midst of all of this, we watched with horror the spring as Russia invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine. And just last week, we learned that the besieged city of Mariupol has fallen to Russian forces. The world also witnessed in the last weeks another act of political violence with the murder of Palestinian American journalist Shireen Abu Akhla, a veteran journalist and champion of free speech. 
highlighting continued assaults on the goal of just peace in that region. All the while, we continue to read reports of global warming and climate change, which are actively causing harm to human beings and our precious earth. And then finally, we've witnessed yet another racially motivated mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, allegedly committed by an 18-year-old white man who traveled 200 miles to carry out his atrocity, motivated by fear of the great replacement, a white supremacist ideology that claims that the presence of immigrants, Muslims, Jews, and people of color will obliterate the white race. Like many other domestic terrorists, Peyton Gendron wrote and publicly posted a manifesto about his beliefs and plans for violence, even going a step further by live streaming his rampage. We reel from this event asking how many more times human perpetrated trauma motivated by xenophobia, white nationalism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, misogyny, and fear of transgender people have to happen before radical social change takes place. As author and professor Brittany Cooper compellingly wrote in an article last week, quote, hasn't every black body said it all before? Stop killing us. We have shouted, protested, cried, begged, pleaded, to no avail, she continues. Somehow we still keep ending up right here. And sadly, we know that this long litany of traumas is, of course, in no way exhaustive. There are people and non-human beings suffering around the world in places we've never even heard of, the names of whom we may never know. The survivors of these events certainly carry wounds, but each time they endure, we endure collective trauma, all of us are wounded. Here the wisdom of Buddhist traditions comes to mind as they highlight the interconnectedness of all beings. When one of us suffers, we all ultimately suffer. It's worth saying that I decided on the topic of this lecture tonight, focused on trauma, grief, and witness, even before most of these recent events took place. My teaching, research, and in many ways, my ministry too, have in the last years focused on these topics. As is obvious by now, and will become even more obvious throughout the rest of my reflections tonight, this isn't exactly cheery work. I sometimes wish I were interested in topics a little less relevant and a bit more uplifting. I know that my words may feel heavy and sober tonight, but they feel necessary in this moment, and I find myself not able to speak otherwise. All the while, as I hope to convey, I do believe that even in the midst of this radical suffering and pain, there are possibilities, even a call for joy, solidarity, transformation, and even healing. As a mentor said to me last summer, as I served as a hospital chaplain during the deadly Delta wave of the pandemic, the joy we experience is just as real as the pain. Her words made me weep as I contemplated the courage needed to hold both of these realities together in one breath. Yet we are called to this difficult task to practice it again and again. I'm reminded of how in my own Christian tradition, the despair and pain of Good Friday cannot ultimately be separated from the joy and new life that comes on Easter morning. Of course, we must also remember that it was Jesus's critique of political and systemic oppression and violence that made him vulnerable to violence and death to begin with. The path to lasting peace and justice and the promise of transformation for all people as demonstrated by Jesus' own example, is indeed a risky and sometimes dangerous one. The questions I want to explore with you and share with you in the rest of my talk tonight arise out of my own grappling with suffering and pain as a theologian, scholar of religion, and minister, but also as a fellow human being who's living through this particular historical moment. At the same time, I acknowledge that as a white, educated, cisgender, middle-class Christian person, I carry privileges that minoritized bodies and marginalized lives do not. And my perspective on trauma and grief is certainly shaped by these privileges. At the intersection of all of this, I want to think about how we are called to bear witness to the historical and present collective trauma and suffering of others, 
I believe that this witness presses us to expand our ability to grieve, not only for our own losses, though this is important, but also for those of others, human and non-human, outside of our immediate circles. Furthermore, I want to suggest that witnessing in this way prompts us to ask questions about the role of grief, both individual and collective. What can our grief, what can our grief teach us? What knowledge does it impart to us about ourselves? What does it teach us about which lives we deem to be grievable in the first place? And finally, how can we extend our sphere of grievability beyond our immediate and familiar circles outward to marginalized human communities and to the earth itself? Might the answers, however provisionary, to these questions provide opportunities for us as global citizens to build solidarity across differences and to inspire resistance to justice, to injustice, or perhaps even offer individuals and collectives the experience of healing and hope? Yes, I know that this is a lot of questions, and I should note here that I have a particular talent and skill for asking questions, while to the frustration of my students, I'm less skilled in providing concrete answers. But perhaps discovering the, quote, right answers is not the goal anyway, as the questions themselves might propel us into new ways of knowing and being in the world. In all honesty, for example, even after years of thinking about the topic, I am still struggling with what it means to be in genuine solidarity with another, and I don't have a clear answer tonight. Yet I'm reminded of a quotation from T.S. Eliot, one of my favorite poets. For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. Of course, that trying involves accountability to our visions and efforts to foster justice and healing, but we are also summoned to embrace the uncertainty inherent in not having clear answers, seeking to inhabit what we might call a liminal space between uncritical, empath excuse me, uncritical certainty and then throwing up our hands in despair. The questions that I'm asking tonight and my provisional answers are not necessarily new. Rather, I seek to weave together my own reflections and questions with the voices of scholars and healers who have taught and inspired me. A note here about the word theology in the title of my talk. Here I conceive of theology in perhaps the broadest sense rather than a narrower classic Christian understanding of theology as, quote, faith-seeking understanding. <clears throat> or a systematic exposition on belief and dogma of any religious tradition. Instead, I am thinking of theology in much the same way as Lutheran theologian Cynthia Mola Beta as, quote, the age-old effort to make sense of our many stories in light of God's presence and power in, with, and for this good creation. Like her, while I'm anchored in the Christian tradition, I'm writing and speaking not only for those who identify with it or any religious tradition at all, for we all seek to make sense of the many stories that we live by. Given this framework, what then might a theology of grief and solidarity look like? To my mind, it must begin with what it means to bear witness to trauma, suffering, and pain. My own exploration of what is meant by this phrase has been interdisciplinary because the concept of witness itself is complex and multivalent. Disparate fields such as media studies, trauma studies, theology, religious studies, and others have all utilized and examined witness as a verb and a noun. I am using the term witness not so much in a legal sense, but rather in the sense of bearing witness where I have recently learned the verb to bear here is connected to an old English term, barren, meaning to carry, bring, bring forth, give birth to, produce, to endure without resistance, support, hold up, sustain, or to wear. To bear witness, to give birth to, or carry witness is, I suggest, a way of seeing, remembering, and truth-telling. While the phenomenon of bearing witness has a long history, and here I think of the Hebrew prophets who witnessed to the suffering of their people and called for justice on their behalf, it was in the last century that scholars and activists 
at least in the West, intentionally grappled with the meaning of witness, deeming this project necessary in the face of 20th century atrocities. This was particularly the case after the Holocaust as individuals and communities bore witness to that unthinkable collective trauma. Trauma scholar Shoshana Fellman has described the 20th century, in fact, as the era of testimony, an age in which witnessing itself has undergone a major trauma. This age, of course, experienced not only the European Holocaust, but also the Armenian Genocide, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Cambodian Genocide, the Palestinian Nakba, and other atrocities, too. Of course, these were preceded by historical collective traumas closer to home, including the genocide of indigenous peoples in the US, the institution of slavery, and the institution of slavery, atrocities which have been called America's original sins. The reality and meaning of trauma on both the individual and collective levels have received renewed attention in the context of the global COVID-19 pandemic. In its original Greek context, and obviously I like to think about the origins of words, um, the word trauma referred to a physical wound caused by an external source. A trauma in this sense was a violent attack upon a vulnerable body, threatening to destroy it. In the 19th century, the notion of trauma expanded to include wounds and injuries upon the psyche as well as the physical body. Scholars later began to conceive of trauma not only in terms of individuals, but also in terms of entire communities that experience trauma, suffering, and pain. This kind of collective trauma, furthermore, is bound up with collective memory, as communities seek to remember and commemorate those events and crises which have inflicted wounds on a people. These experiences prompt questions for communities about how to concretize memories in public forms. My own research, for example, has explored the ways that Norway has sought to remember and concretely memorialize the trauma of July 22nd, 2011, when white supremacist and ethnic Norwegian Anders Breivik murdered 77 people, many of them teenagers, because he disagreed with the liberal immigration policy of the Norwegian government, which he believed these individuals promoted. Like the shooter in Buffalo 11 years later, Breivik was operating with a kind of replacement theory of his own. The process of deciding what to remember and how has been complex and not without disagreement in Norway as is often typical when communities have experienced mass violence. Here I have uh, two photos that I took. One is of what's called the, the memory ring, and it's on the island of Utoya, which is one of the places where Breivik murdered um, his, his subjects. And then on the other side, there's an image of the July 22nd um, museum in Oslo. The collective discernment process of how to remember these events while simultaneously seeking to live into future life together with a new and wounded normal is long and hard work. The design and construction of public memorials in the US and abroad, from the Vietnam Memorial to the Berlin Holocaust Memorial to the September 11th Memorial and Museum have been difficult and sometimes contentious processes. Keeping this need for and challenge of collective remembering in the background, I now want to suggest that there are four main elements of bearing witness to both individual and collective trauma. No doubt that this list is incomplete, but I believe that these serve as a starting point for articulating what it means to bear witness. These elements are in turn part of the theology of grief and solidarity, which I am exploring with you tonight. First, I want to suggest that bearing witness involves genuinely seeing suffering and pain and also making these experiences visible. Making visible here means bringing to light trauma and suffering which has been ignored, downplayed, or erased altogether. 
This particular kind of visibility acknowledges that we can never fully see the suffering of the other in its totality, and that the nature of trauma is such that it often precludes representation in the first place. Survivors of trauma, furthermore, often find that their experiences are virtually incommunicable, that there is simply no language that can fully describe the unthinkable. Theologian and trauma scholar Shelley Rambo writes of this ostensible impossibility. Language falters in the abyss. It fractures at the sight of trauma, she writes. How can a felt sense of terror adequate adequately be described when the experience itself is so out of alignment with our perception of the world. Here, sight and voice intertwine as seeing, suffering, and bearing witness to it does seem to necessitate some degree of communication, even if it is never complete. Here, we might think of how the arts, poetry, narrative, theater, and the visual arts might assist survivors in reclaiming the voice and ability to communicate, which trauma ha and violence has often, at least temporarily, stolen from them. On one of my research, research trips to Palestine, I had the opportunity to visit the Freedom Theater in Janine, the site of refugee camps with a history of trauma, occupation, and violence. The Janine Freedom Theater brings together artists, actors, photographers, and playwrights to tell their stories and to seek liberation through the arts. Bearing witness as seeing also involves remembering what suffering has been erased through dominant narratives which exclude certain kinds of suffering and certain kinds of victims and survivors. I like to conceive of remembering here as literally re membering or putting back together members of a community after a wounding has taken place. In his book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, African-American theologian James Cone brings to light the brutal lynching of at least 4,000 African-Americans in the U.S. from 1880 to about 1940, a period that has been called the lynching era. These acts of violence have been described by the Equal Justice Initiative as terror lynchings, which followed the end of the American Civil War, and ironically, dram dramatically increased after the legal end of slavery. Until recently, these acts of terrorism in American history have largely been forgotten or arguably erased from American public memory. This erasure has begun to erode, thanks to scholars writing about these events, the Equal Justice Initiative, which I just mentioned, and the 2018 establishment of a national memorial for peace and justice and the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. The need for further acts of remembering, reckoning, and reparations regarding lynching and its legacy, however, still remain. In his work, James Cone examines the ways that Christian theology and American churches have failed to take into account the memory and legacy of lynching in the United States, arguing that this, has, that this fail, failure to make connections between the lynchings of African Americans and Jesus' crucifixion is a disturbing and revealing absence. After the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville and the later murder of George, George Floyd, many Americans and their communities, especially those who identify as white, began to see for the first time the ways in which legacies of slavery and Jim Crow reflected and fostered systemic racism in our nation. Confederate statues were toppled, universities interrogated their own histories for traces of racism, and, and many in the majority saw for the first time what black Americans has, have always known, that our legal system privileges white love, lives over others. We can also look to the ways in which certain deaths and suffering due to COVID-19 have been marginalized or ignored. As is well known, black and brown communities have experienced the brunt of COVID deaths. The Mayo Clinic, based, based on CDC data, notes that non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native people 
are 3.1 more times more likely to be hospitalized due to COVID-19 than non-Hispanic white people, non-Hispanic black or African-American people and Hispanic people, furthermore, are both more than twice as likely to be hospitalized due to COVID-19 than non-Hispanic white people. Other lives and deaths seem to have been relegated to the margins of our collective consciousness too, the elderly and those with disabilities, for example. People over 65 have accounted for 75% of all COVID deaths in the US. And as psychologists maintain the emotional effects of isolation and loneliness, especially in nursing homes, can and have actually led to death. It's a bleak situation. So what can we do in response to this limited seeing, this failure to make certain kinds of suffering visible? We must, I think, first adjust our vision so that we can see beyond what and who is portrayed in the news. This necessitates us to pay attention to what I might call the negative space, the absence of faces and stories, to ask whose suffering are we not hearing about and what are we not seeing? We can pause in the face of collective suffering to ask what communities are particularly affected by trauma and why. We can also simply raise questions about how we are publicly remembering these traumas, if at all, and who is shaping the narratives and making decisions about how these memories are made visible and concrete. I have learned that this kind of seeing, which ironically depends upon noticing what is unseen or absent, is no easy task. We can really only do this in community with others, especially those whose stories have been marginalized, for they can help us to see what our particular eyes may not. Moving from sight to visibility, the second aspect of bearing witness, as I am conceiving it, involves being in solidarity with those who suffer, even if they are dramatically different from us. As I mentioned, I'm using the word solidarity here without fully being able to define it. So instead, I'll seek to move toward a definition. I do know that this kind of solidarity requires empathy but importantly, necessitates that this empathy not assume that we can ever fully know or experience the pain of another, nor can it take for granted the privileges that we carry in light of our social locations. This then is what I might call an ethical empathy that recognizes our human limits and resists over-identifying with the other's pain. This is often a challenge in our daily lives when someone we know and love has experienced pain or loss, we seek to be empathetic. I know just how you feel, or I had the exact same experience, we sometimes respond. And we often mean it and mean it in a good way. These can be kind sentiments motivated to help us connect with one another in moments of need, but they can also ignore the very real differences between your particular experience of suffering and mine as well as potential power dynamics at play. I encounter the challenge of responding to, the, responding to and empathizing with raw and all-encompassing grief and trauma last summer as a hospital chaplain. What words do justice, for example, after a family has just unexpectedly lost their 28-year-old sister, a mother to two young children, to pneumonia? In this particular case, I sat with the parents' family for most of the night during an on-call shift. And as a novice chaplain, I struggled with whether my presence was helping or making things worse. Self-conscious of my own body in the room, I mostly stood out of the way, witnessing quietly to the heart-shattering grief that this family was experiencing. I found myself asking a similar question when attending the death of a young and otherwise healthy nurse with COVID who lay prone on a ventilator, his family making the decision to end life support. Tell me about him, was my answer to the silence, the impossibility of knowing what this experience must feel like to them. Meanwhile, life continued in that COVID wing of the ICU as nurses tended to other patients and custodial staff made their routine rounds to empty trash and clean the space. Acts of risk and sacrifice 
in the midst of a pandemic. The line between life and death felt, felt faint in that moment, surreal in a way that was both inexpressible and jolting, but also strangely comforting in reminding me that life continues even in the midst of death and dying. And what was I to say to the grandmother of a one and a half pound baby born almost 17 weeks early, who most certainly would have to fight for her life for weeks, months, or even years? In an unplanned encounter, I just happened to be outside the delivery room when baby Jane was born, holding her grandmother's hand in the uncertainty of whether baby Jane would survive the delivery. When I finished my inter internship months later, she was still in the hospital. In all of these and other moments, I found myself so desperately wanting to relate and connect with patients, to demonstrate solidarity with them, that I was often tempted to fill the silence with over-identified empathetic statements that may have done more harm than good. I learned that in these moments, sometimes just listening and really seeing the pain of the other was, I think, a form of empathy and solidarity. I chose to believe that doing so was, in its own way, bearing witness through keeping my eyes and ears wide open not looking away from the raw pain and loss occurring before me. This was never an easy task, and I did not always succeed, but over the course of my chaplaincy stint, it got a little easier. I'm still striving in my daily life to resist the temptation to rush to words and instead see suffering and pain just as it is. Thirdly, bearing witness means acknowledging, experiencing, and supporting grief and lament, both ours and others. Essential here is acknowledging who and what tends to be grieved and whose grief we ignore. My own experiences of grief, my chaplaincy internship, as well as teaching and learning about Buddhism and existentialist theology have all taught me the delicate and precarious nature of life. We are, as I sometimes tell my students on the first day of class, already dying. As you might imagine, this is sometimes a bit too much reality and brutal honesty, especially at 9 a.m. But I think that ultimately they appreciate the point. In fact, when I recently assigned to the students in my existentialism class to write their own obituary, many of them were surprisingly interested and eager. When my father was diagnosed with late stage cancer, my family, thankfully, was on the same page. Rather than asking, why us? We sought to embrace a different question. Why not us? Buddhism offers a similar perspective, teaching that dukkha, often translated as suffering or pain, is simply part of what it means to be human. Grief over these experiences of pain and loss is a universal phenomenon but for many, it is something to be suppressed and not encouraged. As author and activist, Michelle Cassandra Johnson writes in Finding Refuge, Heart Work for Healing, Collective Grief. We know dominant culture has stolen our rituals and ceremonies around grief through cultural appropriation and a desire to force us to move past instead of through grief. Yet, she maintains, grief is an experience that deserves to be witnessed and affirmed. The pressure to move past rather than through grief can feel acute in a society that encourages us to, quote, get back to normal and to just get over it. As soon as we can after a loss or an experience of trauma, bereavement leaves, if we get them at all, are all too short and getting back to work as soon as possible can even be a bragging right. It is true that we all cope with loss in different ways, and work can be a mechanism of comfort and even joy in the midst of pain. And bereavement doesn't cover all of those other kinds of grief that we experience. The death of jobs, relationships, identities, material conditions, our non-human family members, our health, and collective grief also of political division, prejudice, gentrification, violence, and war. 
Our relationship to grief, both as individuals and collectives, is complicated. We in the West aren't typically comfortable with it, in part because it highlights our own finitude and precarity. Death, after all, is messy, as are sick and dying bodies. Our grief is messy too, and often the pressure of capitalism to continue to produce goods and ideas rarely afford us the space or the time to give grief the attention it deserves. Grief for us often seems to have a time limit. While openly or even privately grieving right after a loss can seem acceptable, grieving longer than that can feel socially problematic. We are too often called to push grief and mourning aside and get back to business, as if nothing has happened, as if our hearts were not gaping wounds. While I have sought to move through grief, through the grief of losing my father eight years ago, taking his last breaths in my arms, no less, I still grieve his absence. Preparing this talk tonight, in fact, jostled open my still mending heart bringing forth streams of tears on more than one occasion. At the same time, I think that accompanying him through his three-year journey with cancer allowed me to experience a kind of anticipatory grief, which actually eased my sorrow over his death, a bittersweet privilege that not everyone has. There is the grief that we experience as individuals, but there is also collective grief which as Michelle Cassandra Johnson writes, is what is experienced by communities when their sense of safety is challenged or stripped away. There are no doubt times when collectives do embrace and experience grief for their communities, which have lost their sense of safety because of trauma and violence. But there can be, I think, a troubling aspect of public mourning that is really only, and paradoxically, again, perceptible by its absence. The truth is that we publicly grieve for some lives and not others. In her book, Frames of War, When Life is Grievable, for example, philosopher Judith Butler argues that who we are in times of war is partially determined by whose lives we mourn and those we don't. Focusing on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan after 9-11, she points to tortures at Abu Ghraib prison and the harassment of Arabs in the United States as reflecting norms of who counts as human and is therefore entitled to human rights. Quote, implicit in this discourse of humanization is the question of grievability, she writes, whose life, if extinguished, would be publicly grievable and whose life would leave either no public trace to grieve or only a partial, mangled, and enigmatic trace. Butler's analysis is re relevant not only in the context of human life, whether <clears throat> of human life, whether and how we grieve the loss of non-human life, the earth itself is intertwined with whether and how we, we act to prevent further loss. Eco-grief, as a concept and a ritual practice, is slowly becoming more mainstream as global communities are experiencing the effects of climate change. In 2019, for example, a funeral was held and a memorial erected for Okyakul, it's Icelandic, also called Ok, the first of Iceland's major glaciers to die because of climate change. The glacier was declared dead in 2014 because its ice had gotten so thin that it could no longer move, one of the criteria for determining glacier status. In my public work on, on my work on public commemoration, I had never encountered a memorial to the natural world. I was profoundly moved, and it touched my own latent grief about climate change. Whether we are considering human or non-human loss, which are, after all, intimately bound with one another, as mentioned, we should ask about how we might extend our sphere of grievability and whether this more inclusive field of grievability might move us to prevent such losses to begin with. I've told the following relevant story before, and the last time, in fact, was right here on the stage at a memorial for my father in 2014. During the summer of 2011, right after my dad was diagnosed, the two of us spent a week together at our cabin in northern Wisconsin. 
We were both feeling the full weight of what we called the existentialist lab, grappling with the change and loss that was before us. The news headlines were bleak. Anders Breivik, the terrorist I mentioned earlier, had just committed his violent attack in Norway. At a loss as how to deal with our despair, my dad and I went out for pizza. Over our Wisconsin cheese pizza and beer, we decided to write an op-ed piece for the Wausau Daily Herald on the Breivik situation, expressing our sadness and the need for dialogue and tolerance. We went home that very night, wrote it, sent it to the paper. It was published the following day. Let's see. We then left that afternoon for his next chemo treatment, staying at the Hope Lodge in Marshfield, which sadly, I just learned, closed in 2020. On the way, the host for the Wisconsin Public Radio Station called to ask if my dad would give an interview about the article. He explained that he would love to, but that he was a bit busy with some other things. We managed to get the interview scheduled, however, and Glenn Moberg called him right after in the lobby of Hope Lodge. In a style so characteristic of my father, he carefully balanced the practicalities of getting ready for his next treatment with offering his public vision of democracy, peace, and civic dialogue. I will always remember one line from that interview about creating an inclusive society. The bottom line is this, Glenn, my dad said in his public voice, reminiscent of his college years working at a radio station in South Dakota. We don't just need to get more people to the table, Glenn. We need a bigger table. In many ways, we can think about expanding our own ability to grieve and recognizing the grief of others as creating a bigger table for that grief. We do need to invite more people, especially those whose grief has been marginalized, but we also need a big enough collective space to do that. How as citizens might we create these kinds of spaces? I believe that WIPS has created such spaces through its courageous and timely programs, which so often bring together disparate voices to bear on issues like political division, violence, and collective values, both local and global. How might we in these kinds of spaces and also in communities of faith more fully reckon with what has been lost and express together a sense of lament, not just about our own suffering, but also for the suffering of the other? Finally, from grief, we move to the fourth, and I promise, the final aspect of bearing witness, which involves dissent and resistance through critique, but also through embracing joy. This element of witness is a sober assessment of what needs to change so that individual and collective traumas are not repeated. It also includes an active critique of systems that have caused or aggravated suffering. Even natural disasters can be viewed in this way, in part because of human-caused climate change, but also because those who suffer the most in natural disasters are those who are most marginalized to begin with. Liberation, liberation theologian John Sabrino calls these kinds of disasters x-rays of a country. Despite the pain that they cause or because of it, they are bearers of truth for who and what it is that we value in a community. Examining the deadly 2001 earthquake in El Salvador, Sobrino suggests that the disaster made clear the extensive poverty there and how the poor were already at a disadvantage. The response to a disaster like this presents a call to take seriously the needs of the most vulnerable in a community. Bearing witness here involves an honest collective assessment of the results of these x-rays, to use Sobrino's phrase, and then offering our dissent and resistance to the systems and structures that cause or aggravate violence and trauma. This is a form of truth-telling that, like all aspects of bearing witness, necessitates courage and risk. I venture to say that the founders or early leaders of almost all religious traditions engaged in truth-telling of offering their dissent to at least some aspect of the status quo. 
Dissent and resistance, however, cannot be separated from active and intentional hope and a commitment to healing. And here, I finally approach the promised uplifting part of my talk. This act of hope involves taking a stand that, in fact, another reality is possible. I'm tempted here to say that another world is possible, but I don't want to suggest that transformation and healing cannot take place in this world, the one in which we currently live and move and have our being, to use the language from another context borrowed from Paul in the New Testament. In Christian theology, this tension is reflected in twin claims, the biblical assertion that peace and justice will reign in a future kingdom or kingdom to come, and a belief that the kingdom is already moving among us, that it breaks in not only in some future time, but right here and right now. I believe that we experience this new reality in moments of making visible the pain of others while feeling and expressing a deep and responsible empathy and creating a space for the other to grieve no matter who they are. I saw this on the hospital floors last summer, not only with other chaplains, but with nurses too. Or conversely, perhaps it means that others see our own healing, our own hidden pain, offering us recognition and acknowledgement that might help us to begin healing. But we experience this inbreaking too when one community bears witness to the trauma of another, engaging in genuine solidarity across radical difference. Here I think about Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel's partnership with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not only along that famous march from Selma to Montgomery in 1965 and the struggle for racial justice, but also in their shared commitment to end the war in Vietnam. We experience the inbreaking when we say a resolute no to the systems that perpetrate violence, oppression, and the valuing of some lives above others, and then enact that no through advocacy, activism, and confronting our own complicity in these patterns. We also experience the inbreaking of this kingdom when we, with, along with others, bear witness to hope itself. This kind of hoping involves embracing and affirming our experiences of love, joy, and delight, just as we keep our eyes open to see the suffering that is right before us. Brisha Wade, author of Grieving While Black, an anti-racist take on oppression and sorrow, brings her experiences as a NICU chaplain in the hospital, a former Baptist and practicing Buddhist, to bear on questions of grief and healing. Reading her work has been immensely helpful for me, given her perspective as a chaplain and her social location as a black woman in the US. Wade distinguishes between passive hope and active hope, where the former maintains the status quo and coerces more marginalized people, especially women of color, to be patient when striving for their rights. But the latter, active hope in contrast, involves mutuality and an acceptance that there may be conflict and setbacks in the struggle for justice and inclusion, but this should not have to lead to complacency. Emphasizing that like other black people in the US, she has grown weary of having to wait for those with privilege to do the work of justice. Yet she also notes that healing and liberation are quote, ways of being that are cultivated through practice and that a particular kind of patience is called for when practicing healing as a form of justice. While recognizing the present inbreaking of this radically different way of being that bears witness to hope, there is also wisdom to the idea that it will come into being at a future time. All of what I've mentioned tonight, this bearing witness, this hoping, is long, hard work. The project of extending these moments of inbreaking, in the words of a friend of mine who has taught me so much, is work for the long haul. As Wade writes, liberation is not a goal, it is an intentional practice. Sometimes we will make mistakes and hurt each other, but we must own our mistakes and keep working. Like engaging in active hope and practicing liberation, we also experience the kingdom breaking in when we allow ourselves to feel joy and pleasure and to experience delight. This is not always easy. After long days at the hospital last summer, witnessing loss and death, 
for example, I sometimes felt guilty experiencing joy as I laughed and read with my son or felt the wind on my face in a morning run. In my daily life, I, it sometimes feels incongruous to take delight in daily pleasures like gathering with friends, planting sunflower seeds, which Elliot and I have been doing lately, watching the nascent stems pu push their way up through the soil, or hearing the birds, oh, the birds, and beautiful conversation in the early morning light at the very same time that we know others near and far are in acute pain. Sometimes the tension feels nearly intolerable to me, but lately I've begun to consider these experiences of joy and delight as a form of resistance. Perhaps even more to the point here, I've begun to consider them as acts of bearing witness to the reality that my chaplain mentor articulated to me, that joy, pleasure, and delight are just as much a part of being human as our experiences of suffering and pain. Genuine solidarity involves celebrating with and making possible for others to experience deep joy too. After all, and I have to continually remind myself of this, joy is not a zero-sum game that operates on a sense of scarcity, or at least it shouldn't. Instead, it is a human right that is or should be abundantly available to all. Thus, even as we are called to bear witness to suffering and pain, I believe that we are called to bear witness to the possibility and actuality of joy. Yes, the world is obviously deeply wounded, and yes, tragically, our local and global communities will experience more trauma, and joy happens in the midst. This embrace of joy isn't a call for complacency or an acceptance that things are okay. It is rather the opposite. To engage in this practice of bearing witness and to really sustain it, we have no choice but to celebrate joy whenever and wherever we find it. Eight days after my father, eight days before my father died, I received an email from him, the subject line of which simply said, wow. The only text in the body of the email was just great. I never really knew what the source of this wow was. It might have been in response to seeing the proofs of a book I was writing. Given his support, that would make sense. But I entertain the possibility that he was simply witnessing to the fullness of his life, the joy that he had experienced, and even the journey that lay ahead of him as the line between life and death started to blur. Wow, indeed. I conclude with part of a poem by the great Maya Angelou, herself a prophet and witness to hope, entitled On the Pulse of the Morning. It's fitting not only because it reflects the tenor of my reflections tonight, but also because my father gave me a copy of her poetry in 2006 with a note saying that he bet, he liked the word bet, her poems might end up in a sermon of mine one day, or as I might add retroactively, perhaps in a public talk in a beautiful place. On the pulse of the morning. The horizon leans forward, offering you the space offering you space to place new steps of change. Here on the pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less to Midas than the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. Given the time of day, I likewise wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Jenny will take questions now. Um, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and Luke or I will bring the microphone to you. Um, it is important to use the microphone because otherwise, people who are live streaming, who are watching the live stream, uh, won't be able to hear you. So, any questions? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for your excellent talk. Could you repeat, please, the titles of the books you have written? Yeah. Oh, of my, that I've written. <laughs> I was thinking that I've quoted. Um, yes. Oh, gosh, if I can remember the titles. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. You know, I, I teach, and so I forget the whole microphone thing. Um, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I'm trying to remember the title of my own book. Um, so um, it's uh, the Theology and Islam. Um, the Danish, the Danish cartoon crisis, and the social imaginary. So it was a, um, it was my dissertation that I turned into a book, and it was on the 2005 and six um, Danish cartoon crisis, if if people remember that. Um, so it's sort of an analysis of. Um, sort of the, the Christian Lutheran framework of Denmark uh, and also secularism and also the coming of Muslims there and, and um, how they could think about community. So, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was uh, interested in your proper way of memorializing in Cambodia, uh, Tool Slang, the uh, torture center has been uh, mm -hmm. kept as it was. It was a very eerie place to go through because it had not been cleaned up whatsoever. All the tools and implements of torture were there. It, uh, you could almost feel mm. the, the pain that went on there. And then also the uh, towers that were built, and this has gotten a bit of criticism, uh, towers with shelves with uh, many, many skulls. And many of them with uh, pieces missing from the back of the head because mm. most people were clubbed to death. And uh, I know people criticize at times that those skulls should be, should be buried. Mm. And uh, the uh, Khmer Rouge desecrated the bodies by separating the skulls from the heads because uh, the belief that the whole body had to be present to, in other words, the, the spirit would never be reunited if they separated mm -hmm. them. Uh, t so I don't know if, what, I, I was really tremendously moved by both the, those kind of memorials. I don't know what you would think of those. Yeah, no, no thank you for that and, and adding another um, example of a public memorial, memorials. Um, and also the challenges uh, involved in creating them and sustaining them, and um, that again, sort of what what gets unseen, you know, and what do you do? Um, and especially if there are religious, uh, you know, um, frameworks for thinking about death and life. So, yeah, I haven't. I would love to. Actually, my mother's going to go to Cambodia soon. I would love to go there and and um, experience um, some of those memorials, but. Yeah, I'll just say, it. yeah, I mean, I think it just, you're highlighting um, the depth um, and challenge, I think, of those questions and how, how moving it is, too, and how important they are, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Mark Knoll has a little book on Christianity and slavery, and in it he argues that in the South, prior to the Civil War, slavery was supported by quoting from the Old Testament. And in the North, the anti-slavery groups were mm. quoting from the New Testament. Hmm. And then the Civil War intervened and ended the institution of slavery. But uh, he goes on to say that the real problem that emerged is that the people became too, or the Christians became too tired of dealing with the issue, and so they ignored the issue of mm. racism. We have been through COVID, and here in central Wisconsin, the number of deaths is not diminishing the way mm. we expect that it would, and yet we seek to return to normal. You see it evident everywhere where people go without masks and mm go without vaccination, uh, so on, but they still die. Uh, any comment? Well, I, you know, what you're saying reminds me of, um, actually I had to take it out of my talk because it was, talk was a little too long anyway, but um, I'm interested in, in um, you know, trauma too that, that continues, you know, it's, so it's like it's historical and in the past, but, but sometimes trauma continues in, in sometimes more devastating ways, I think, and so, 
But I also think, like you're saying, we have sometimes a tendency to, I don't know, for, forget that, you know, or, or want to leave it behind. Um, but it still continues to affect us. And so I think um, to our detriment, you know, I think both in terms of health in this case, but also just in sort of keeping our eyes open, you know, kind of what I was saying. So, um, yeah, no, I, especially as a kiddo, you know, who can't be vaccinated yet, I want to say the pandemic's not over, you know. Um, so, yeah, thank you. When you uh, deal with uh, putting on your historical face as a historian, um, one of the things I've noticed is that there's a, um, a tendency to judge everything in history from the present. I think it's called presentism. And um, historians really get in knots about this because uh, what do you do? I, I can see not honoring some things by not having monuments uh, like they've done with the Confe old Confederacy and so forth, but um, what do you do when you start attacking Jefferson because Jefferson isn't acting like we think he should to a day, and yet there's a lot to be honored about uh, Jefferson or even Washington or even Abe Lincoln has been attacked. Uh, do you have any comments on that as when you do uh, your history writing? Oh, that's a good question too, and I appreciate your perspective. And as you're a historian, is that? Well, I, I'm not a professional in a sense of writing a lot of books or teaching at university or anything like that. Yeah, but still, yeah, concerned with issues of history. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good question, and I, boy, I mean, I that the challenge as we saw, I mean, it was there before, but you know, after George Floyd's death, and and thinking about monuments, and how how do you do that? I mean, you're right, we're in the 21st century with a lens looking in the past, at the same time, those were, in exa for example, those monuments affect people in the present, you know, and, and can cause further trauma. And so I don't have an answer, but I think, again, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out this, holding both of those, you know, and I don't know, and I think sometimes maybe it's the best thing to, you know, <laughs> take them down, maybe put them somewhere else where, you know, they can be, looked at, observed, and not forgotten, but perhaps in a way that, you know, people who still might experience oppression or trauma from those people don't have to look at them every day. But I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I'm also interested in this question in terms of theology, right, and thinking about even Jesus or, you know, historical religious figures, like, you know, was Jesus a feminist? I, you know, it's like, I, well, you know, what do we think about feminism today? What does that, you know, mean? And so I don't, you know, it's not a straightforward answer, I guess, but I appreciate, yeah, the question. I think it's really tricky. Jenny, I attended a webinar a couple of weeks ago that was for people who've been doing work of, um, getting COVID vaccines and COVID information to people in marginalized communities. And um, forget the exact context, but somebody brought up the fact that, actually I remember now, it was somebody from Arkansas or Alabama, and they shared how their State Department of um, Public Health had created an online memorial for people to share um, oh. share what they wanted to about their loved ones who had passed from COVID which led to this mm. kind of you know, realization among us that that isn't really happening, that you know, especially everybody in this space has been really you know, doing the boots on the ground work of dealing with the disease, and it led to a discussion about how, how should we, or you know, how, how are people, or how should we be memorializing the, the victims of COVID. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, oh my gosh. And I haven't thought about, um, that's such a good point about kind of online spaces and <laughs> whatever the problems of living online, you know, I do think that there are possibilities that we were all kind of, um, that we all encountered, you know, in, in the pandemic, which we're still in. But um, so that's an interesting, um, I don't know, model of what it might mean to collectively remember. But um, yeah, I mean, I think part of that too is that, again, we haven't, reckoned with our own grief. I mean, if we could pause and just, I mean, again, of course, we've all experienced loss and some of you more acutely, but 
you know, to be able to pause and think about all of what we have lost. You know, I mean, in the U.S., one million people, you know, and that's just here. So I don't know. Like, I don't know how we kind of should collectively pause, you know, enough, especially with people who are actively working <laughs> to end it. And it's ongoing. So I think that's part of the challenge. Again, you know, it's like, how do you memorialize and grieve while you're still in it? And I don't have an answer, but, you know, I do think, you know, I, again, I, you know, I go back to whips. Like, I mean, I do think that talking about it online or in person, you know, is helpful. But I don't know, we, we have to figure out how to remember together, you know, and to grieve together. So, yeah, thank you. One more. <laughs> I noticed that you've been um, interested in Kierkegaard and, yeah. and philosophy and so forth. Um, how, what's your uh, feeling about the trend, it seems to be, that there's, uh, um, they don't accept what's really true. You know, truth is not neutral. And, um, you know, we can give the obvious one, the Holocaust, we know what happened, but yet there are people who are deniers and they say we should be discussing the other side in this. We have a tendency now, I see there's groups in the United States that are saying we've got to discuss all sides, but sometimes, like I say, truth is, not, is, it, truth is neutral, uh, is not neutral. You, you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, I sometimes, um, yes, I love, I didn't bring Kierkegaard much into the conversation, but I would love to do that in a part two. But, um, but uh, yeah, I, sometimes theologically, I think about the tension, um, even kind of before thinking about exactly what you're asking, but the tension between um, being inclusive and hospitable and pro being prophetic, you know, which is a, sort of a theological way, I think, of, of sort of truth-telling, you know? Um, and absolutely, you know, bring people together with disparate uh, positions, but at the same time, I mean, I, you know, the pandemic, for example, the pandemic is real, you know? I mean, and but there are people who are denying that. Um, so it's tricky, I mean, I, you know, I. You know, I'd say that there, there are some things that are, are just true. Now, I know that everybody could say that, too. Um, but, you know, but I think also it just reminds me of what I was saying about seeing, you know, and how can we uh, nuance or deepen our vision, you know, to, to, to be able to see um, and to see reality as it is and to see truth, you know. Um, I don't know what I, I mentioned that I went to Palestine a couple of times um, for research and what I saw there, you know, in the, in the way that um, the occupation has affected Palestinians, I, I could not unsee what I saw. Um, and it doesn't mean that there are experiences and perspectives in Israel that are valid and, and we need to talk about those too, but I'm just thinking of like, I saw that. Not everybody has the privilege, again, of seeing something, but, um, you know, or being in the hospital and witnessing and being with people who are dying from the pandemic, you know? <laughs> but, so I had little tolerance for, you know, that spirit of things after I was in the hospital that summer. Um, so I think it's tricky. I don't know. Dialogue and truth telling. Yeah, thank you. One last question. This uh, looking and, and seeing, we were in India, uh, and this uh, lion, uh, he was belonged to the Lions Club in India, would always walk out his door and give some money to a woman who was begging. And one day he said he stopped, and he saw her. And then he found out her background and that she was a leper and that they were living in terrible mm -hmm. conditions and then built a leper colony where they had decent housing. So stopping and not just looking, but that, that concept of seeing is really, really a significant one. So thank you for that. Oh, well, you're welcome, and thank you for sharing that too. I think that's, your, that's what a lovely example you know, of, of 
yeah, not just looking, but actually seeing, you know, and that that builds relationships too. Um, so not only awareness, but um, a certain kind of relationality and mutuality that we all desperately need. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Jenny. Um, please join me in thanking Jenny for this wonderful presentation. Thank you all for coming. Um, I can say with a fair amount of certainty, it will not be two years before we give you a chance to come to another WIPS event in person. So um, if you're not on our mailing list, make sure you uh, get on, sign up at the, at the table out there and have a good night. When is Jenny scheduled to come back? Oh. <laughs> when, you, have, you, have a, you have a book that's... I have a book in progress. It's been in progress for a little while, so... Um, yeah, but uh, I'll, let you, I'll let you know, but thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>